John Moylan was a giant in Catholic education because he viewed Catholic education as a family and a family activity, and he was thrilled to play the role of father. Part of what makes him remarkable as a father and a father figure is that he lost his own dad at age three. But John intuited from his mother and family and from the teachers and coaches in Catholic schools, and especially from the assumptionist priests, how a parent should be. Take care of those around you. Welcome new members to the family. Be responsible. Set a good example. Demand the best. Love them unconditionally. Teach them to live their prayers and make them safe and secure. And that's why during John's long tenure at DeMatha, he was the father of his DeMatha family. Others will talk about the singular great love of his life, Joan, and his devotion to Kevin, Tim, Kathleen, Patrick, and their spouses, and all of his grandkids. But I want to talk about the second great love of his life, DeMatha. It helps to be reminded that when John started at DeMatha in the fall of 1956, he originally came to interview for a part-time replacement job, and he thought he might only hang around until he finished his master's in education at Catholic University. When John arrived on campus on a Saturday for his interview, he found the then principal, Father Mark Toll, mopping the floor which John ended up doing himself innumerable times over the years. And he was convinced to come back and observe a French class. And when he did that, he disciplined a kid who was being disrespectful and said to himself, I'm better than this guy, I'll give it a go. He started teaching full time, French and Spanish, while in graduate school, and he never looked back. His experience in Catholic schools, and Army intelligence gave him a keen sense of how destiny could be shaped if you worked hard enough and believed strongly enough. And that decision changed the course of DeMatha's history and the course of Catholic education in the Archdiocese of Washington and arguably across the country. Within a couple of years, John had established the first counseling center of any school in the Archdiocese. And in 1968, he became the first lay principal at any Catholic school in the Archdiocese. And when he went to his first meeting of school leadership, he was surrounded by 143 nuns, priests, and religious brothers. John invented the idea of summer school as a way to help kids who needed additional work get that in. He began the music program at DeMatha in 1970 despite the fact that, like me, he has no musical ability. But he knew viscerally that the study and mastery of music was important in itself, and that the teamwork and camaraderie it induced, that the discipline it required, and that the joy it brought those who played or sang was matched by the joy of those who watched. In short, it shared much with another of his loves, athletics. His innovations were remarkable. The first computer science department in the archdiocese in the mid 70s. The first business department in the 60s. Mechanical drawing and architectural design in 1961. Always the search to find ways to make connections to kids. Attract students with a program they want and send them out with a Catholic liberal arts education. Without John's leadership and guidance, there is no DeMatha. His force of will and his stamina and leadership saved the school from closing. No one has ever been a more ardent proponent of the Trinitarian mission. He had helpers, of course, but without John, again, there would be no DeMatha. A common thread of coaching runs through all of John's encounters. He loved the individual work that a position coach does, the teaching, the practicing, the celebrating of successes, and the commiserating over failures. He coached countless teachers and countless students and countless athletes, most notably in kicking, 
but in tennis, in basketball, in a bunch of other sports. He wanted every one of them to succeed, and he loved them all. John was thrilled to see those he helped on their journey, but he always recognized it was their journey and not his. That ability to be ambitious for others, for the school, for workers throughout the archdiocese, without being personally ambitious, is a quality so rare and difficult that its very existence is a mark of excellence. Known for his ferocious defense of and promotion of DeMatha, that sometimes, given John's urgency and blunt speaking, created enemies, his critics failed to recognize that John was a proponent of Catholic education generally. Two of his enormous contributions to Catholic education involve equity and inclusiveness for students and equity for teachers. And those are things that we take for granted now. John admitted black students to DeMatha in the early 1950s, before Brown versus Board of Education. And he admitted students that other schools wouldn't take chances on academically. He believed that all kids who wanted a Catholic education should get a chance at one. And so he built a school and established programs, not just for students who would succeed anywhere, but for students who struggled academically, students who needed help. And he did this without ever stigmatizing kids. John made DeMatha inclusive, racially, economically, academically, before anyone knew that was a thing. And perhaps no surprise, people who didn't like losing games to DeMatha or students to DeMatha denigrated the school as academically inferior. A more grotesque lie has never been told. So other schools were forced to follow one of John's many bromides. Analyze, don't criticize. And schools around us put money into academic programs, arts programs, athletic programs, campus ministry programs. And that turned out for the betterment of every school, DeMatha included, and every kid who went there. For many years, John insisted that DeMatha be open to students with severe developmental disabilities from the Kennedy Krieger Institute, which is now closed, and that those students who did have their own classroom participate as much in the life of the school through phys ed and art and music and anything that they could do and any extracurricular that they wanted. It was my great privilege to teach some of those students in literature and in film. In the early 1970s, John began work on a series of archdiocesan councils to force parishes to pay a living wage and offer health insurance and other benefit programs to lay employees. To say that he made enemies by insisting on this would not be too strong a term. One might even say, that by hiring outstanding coaches who developed winning programs, that John gave a template to countless other schools who determined to follow DeMatha by creating great music or sports programs because lots of learning takes place in those areas. There was no archdiocesan committee on which John didn't serve when asked, and almost by himself, he invented shadow programs, school visits, school fairs, the entire application apparatus and testing programs that we all take for granted. John's DNA is in all of them. John's work as a teacher, a counselor, an administrator, a coach, and even a janitor meant that whenever people had to see him about an issue, he was capable of understanding their point of view, of both listening and hearing. Even if you didn't get what you wanted, he made decisions from a staggering base of knowledge and experience. Whenever he was recognized for his excellence, whether by the Archdiocese, the National Catholic Education Association, or the Washington Post, John deflected. It was the faculty and the kids who did the work, he would say. And John had, like me, an expansive definition of teacher, one that included all the support staff, the trainers, the maintenance people, the cafeteria workers, and so on, 
because anyone who interacts with a student is involved in a teachable moment and students' lives are altered in those moments. I was a student in John's DeMatha and of John's DeMatha. For four years as a student and then 16 years as a teacher, I can count on one hand the amount of times he wasn't in the building when I was. He was never outworked. A favorite story of mine is that when traveling many places with Joan, she drove so that John could sit in the passenger seat of the car and work on DeMatha business. In fact, when I started as principal in 2000, I told the first gathering of faculty and staff that I wanted to do something John had not done at DeMatha in the prior 32 years, but that I couldn't find anything. And then I realized there was one thing he didn't do, so I took a vacation. A list of what I learned from John would run several volumes, and John would be embarrassed by all of it. He believed in the power of great teachers, and he knew that for teachers to be great, you had to trust them. Now that trust bred responsibility, and it certainly helped that everywhere you looked on the faculty, there were people who were the best in their fields. Think of his two great peers, Buck Offit, Morgan Wooten. Every teacher aspired to be worthy of being on the same faculty as those two, and those who didn't measure up didn't stay. John's honesty was a great gift, if occasionally uncomfortable to be on the receiving end of, and he would often say, we can disagree without being disagreeable. How quaint that insistence on civility sounds now. And that is how he came to tell me in March of 2000, when I was appointed the next principal, that he didn't support the Trinitarians choosing me to succeed him. True to form, he told me without hurting my feelings, well, not much, and then pivoted for the past 21 years to being my cheerleader, confidant, defender, supporter, sounding board, mentor, and friend. Here are a couple of stories from the first week I was on the job and he was in the office next to me with a pass-through door. And during the second week, I had another lock installed. On June 26, 2000, I showed up and helped him move his stuff next door. And he told me he might have to come in and check the computer because his email got sent to that particular computer. Technology wasn't his strong suit. People were. After a day or two, he came in and wanted me to smell something. And I told him as a veteran parent that I had smelled enough bad milk and dirty diapers and that if what he was holding smelled bad to him, that he should throw it out. And he told me that he had a sample of a new kind of urinal cake and I needed to smell it to approve whether we would buy it or not. I was struck then, as I am now, by the attention to detail he exhibited in everything. Even so, it was something of a surprise that in the next couple of days, he brought me a ring of carpet swatches the size of a basketball so that I could pick out the walk-off mats. And we both went to the locker room to look at flat top versus angle top lockers, to test 16 gauge versus 18 gauge sheet metal for the material. Did we want a grate or slots for air circulation and visibility? Every detail mattered. I relished and still relish all these times we spent together, but I still had a lock put on that pass through door. And when he suggested that Thanksgiving mornings were a particularly good time to come in, get some work done, and clean the parking lot from the prior night's alumni gathering, I told him I didn't think my marriage would survive that. We attended countless functions together, and he had a great sense of humor with alums and alumni parents. His memory of individual students and encounters was beyond belief. He filled up every room he was in, and he filled up every heart. On his desk, which I now occupy, but which is still his desk, John left me a long handwritten letter to welcome me. He promised to help me however he could, and he reflected on what the principal's role is in a way I had not seen before. To illustrate his point, he taped a cutoff key 
sometimes called a construction key, to the letter. On a construction site, as rooms are finished and they need to be secured, a part of a key is inserted into the lock to make it faster for whoever is checking the building or the work to use the partial key to get into every room. The principle is nothing without the complementary parts. But the principle has to be able to go everywhere and support everything to render things secure. No one at any time in any place has ever done it better. Because of John, Damatha's father, we are secure. I miss him ferociously, but he is not really gone. I know he is present in all of us. Godspeed, John. Godspeed.